All right. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave them the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Let's pause for a moment of silence so that we can prepare ourselves for the intake of his word. Let us pray. <clears throat> Our Father, we do thank you for this time where we can come together on a Sunday afternoon in comfort, in uh, comfortable chairs in this air-conditioned building so that we can know you more. Father, you've provided for all of this. It truly is your grace. Just the fact that the church, uh, the Lutheran church, is allowing us to assemble here so that we can worship you in spirit and in truth is fantastic when you really think about it. And so we are grateful, Father, and we sometimes forget that you are behind all the details. We understand that you orchestrate all things, but something as simple as coming here between the two doors, the three doors behind us, is truly an example of your grace towards us. And I trust and I pray that we would recognize that, that, uh, that all of this is because of you. We know, Father, that you've, you care for us, you care for the world, and you have even provided your only Son, your only begotten Son, so that people who believe in him, those who would believe in him, would have everlasting life, would be adopted into your family so that they can spend all eternity with thee. So, Father, as we continue to move through this series, as we continue to do things throughout the week as representatives of yours, as a, an ambassador of Christ, I pray that you would allow us to see those things, those people, those who would need you in a personal way, and that we would make an impact, whether it's by our actions with no words, or by our words without actions, or maybe a combination of the two so that they would come to faith by believing in Jesus Christ for everlasting life. Thank you, Father, for the awesome responsibility that you have bestowed upon each and every person who is a believer in Christ in this room to know that we can influence a person who is spiritually dead, headed for the lake of fire, but can, as a result of our initiative, come to faith and then spend all eternity with thee. Thank you for reminding us of this important detail. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we are continuing, as you know, with Acts, the beginning of the church age. We have looked at verse 1, and I'll just lift the verses here. I will put them up on the PowerPoint so that you can kind of see where we're going. Verse 1, we spent a couple weeks there prior to, uh, after the, um, the outline and the key points with regards to the Holy Spirit. We got into verse 1, and uh, we noticed that it is the former account I made. Luke speaking, and he has two volumes. This is volume 2, and Luke is volume 1. So volume 1, volume 2... Uh, the book of Luke, the book of Acts, same author, two volumes, and it's a continuation of, uh, with regards to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he mentions Theophilus. There isn't a lot of information on Theophilus, although I did mention a few things. And then uh, he goes on and says that Jesus began both to do and teach. And we, I had pointed out that the chronology and the order here I think is important. You got to do something first before you can teach something. So before you can preach and preach and preach and preach and tell people about how great Jesus is, sometimes you have to first walk the talk. 
And as you walk the talk, now people would be in a position to listen to that talk. Because if all you do is give the Word of God and you teach it, you share it, and you tell them that they need Jesus, but then during the week you're not walking that talk. They call that hypocrisy. The Bible calls that hypocrisy. Sometimes we call that, uh, a, that person a hypocrite. And so the order here I think is worth noting that Jesus began both to do and then teach. So what did he do? Well, he fed people before he taught people. Sometimes he would take care of people. He would meet the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, initiate a conversation and do something no one else, no other Jew would do, which is to talk to a Samaritan. And he said, could you help me with some water? Unheard of. Unheard of. You don't talk to Samaritans. You're supposed to avoid them. They're half-breeds. But Jesus had to go there, as we've seen in John chapter 4, because in the big picture, the big scheme of things, he needed to talk to this one woman who would then in turn talk to the city that she was trying to avoid in the heat of the day. So she met Jesus. Jesus said, can I have some water? And then she later on, as you see, it goes into a theological discussion about worship. And then he talks to her about, uh, you know, go call your husband. And you know the rest of the story. She was amazed and said, you must be a prophet. And then, of course, you know, she left her water pot and she shared to the entire city. And we don't think much of this, but this, she was, the reason why she was going in the heat of the day is because of her reputation. She was known for being a loose woman. She had five husbands and the guy that she was wood with was not even her husband. So that's pretty clear. And she was trying to avoid the, the, the people uh, because of that reputation. But guess what she did after she met Jesus Christ? It totally changed her life. She said, could this be the one? And because of her word, many believed. And because of her word, some who didn't believe her initially went to hear Jesus personally and then believed. Many believed, the scripture says. And why is it worth bringing this out? Because I know that you all are experts on John 4. Mm -hmm. Because of what we see here. This is the master at work. The master at work began both to do and then to teach. And when he was doing what he knew to be true, that was honorable before God, that was consistent with the teaching, then he would make application. So it's better, they say, um, what's the saying, how's the saying go? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Have you heard that before? So maybe that would be kind of, an, uh, uh, we can add that to this. People don't care how much Bible you know or how much scripture you know <coughs> until they know you first care about them. And then once they sense that you do care about them, then they would be receptive to hearing. How do we know? Well, experience. I'm sure you've done this in the past. And again, we're following the footsteps of none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Can anybody best Jesus Christ? And I would say no. There are a lot of great theologians and scholars, but they fall to the wayside when we compare them to the Lord Jesus Christ. So if doing precedes teaching, we should adopt that as a way of life. Our lives should reflect. Our, in fact, our, we should be carrying out and making application to the things we've already studied so that when people come into contact with us, they're already in the receiving mode of those things that would be part of the doing. Otherwise, if you act like the world, we're no different. We're not representing him at all. And they are familiar with the world, the world as it is. And if they see that we're doing the exact same thing, we could, depending on what it is, it could be... Uh, they could conclude that we're just a hypocrite. And then we looked at verse 2. They, he continued to do this until the day in which he was taken up. I focused on that for a week or so. And that's the doctrine of ascension. He is now seated at the right hand of the Father. But he was taken up. It's in the passive voice. The Father was the one who took him up. He did not fly on his own. It was Jesus Christ uh, who was taken up by the, fa uh, by the Father. 
And after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. And remember, we talked briefly last week, and I think even before that, that the word chosen has chosen for service and chosen for salvation. Chosen for service and salvation. And I think the majority, the majority of the times that we see the word chosen before the foundations of the world, sometime, I would say the majority of the times, it's in reference to service, not salvation. And then we looked at Pharaoh, how he was chosen, so was Moses, but they were chosen for service. They were chosen to be able to communicate and to declare to the world that God is in control. And he, as the, as the potter, he can do whatever he wants with the clay when you look at Romans. So we looked at that last week and we noticed that the word chosen, sometimes uh, we have a, sometimes a reaction and we think, oh, chosen for salvation. And that's typically uh, amongst the, those who are in talking about Calvinism and hyper-Calvinism and those kind of things. And so, but again, I just thought I'd bring that out. Now we are on verse 3. This is where we left off last week. Remember, verse 3 says, To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering. And that, I think, is extremely important. Because if Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ did not rise, then we're just one of many religions out there. I mean, why are you here? I mean, if someone were to just ask you do, you, do you really know why you come to church? I mean, what is it about church, whether it's Church of Hope or another church? Why do you subscribe to Christianity? What is your basis for driving all the way here just so that you can study the scripture? Are you sure that Christianity is the only way, as your teacher would say. What did your teacher say? I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And what does it say? What did he say after that? No one comes to the Father except through me. Are you sure about that? So if I gave you 15 minutes on radio, would you dialogue with me and give me some compelling proof that what you believe in is true? I mean, is there, I mean, you don't have to fully give me all the evidence, but can you give me at least one or two? I mean, for example, the Buddhists, they're nice people. They don't hurt anybody. They meditate and stare at a, at a hole in a wall all day. They don't hurt anybody. You think God is going to send them to hell? They don't even do anything. They're monks. A lot of them uh, become priests. And they stay in a monastery for the rest of their life. And they don't hurt anybody. Is God going to send them away for all eternity? You're going to have questions like that. And that's not the purpose of this particular series. But I want you to see some of these things that could add weight to why it is you do what you do. Part of it, it should be because he was alive after his suffering. After the, re after the crucifixion, he died, was buried, and on the third day, he rose again according to the scriptures. That's one reason. Wouldn't that be valid? Wouldn't that be a, a strong, compelling reason why you believe in Jesus Christ and why you're a Christian as opposed to something else? That's embedded in verse 3. He presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. That's the reason why we come together. You're tired, you want to stay home, you want to do things, me too. But why do we come here? Because we know that there are many infallible proofs. We know that Jesus Christ is real and because he lives, we will live also. That's why. Many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days. Not just one day, two days, three days, a little over a month. There was empirical evidence. And so we could develop that if we wanted to, but that, again, it's not what we're going to do here in, in our series in Acts. 
but we can talk about, well, because that's true, how will that impact us as, a, as believers? What, that, what should that do for us? If he really came back with, if there were many infallible proofs, as the scripture says, if he was seen during the 40 days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, meaning that, meaning that he came back and he was speaking and engaging in a conversation with several people, we're going to see in just a moment, then should that not motivate us to talk about Christ? To learn more about Christ? He's the only one that I'm aware of that was able to provide um, to come back alive after much suffering and after cru being crucified, being able to anticipate, predict his, his own death and to say, destroy this body in three days, I'm going to raise it up. And he did. And not only did he do that, but there was many infallible proofs spanning over 40 days which is supposed to be used by us, not the unbelievers. The unbelievers, it's to add credibility to considering Jesus Christ, but to us, it's actually designed to equip us and empower us and motivate us to share John 3.16, John 6.47, Acts 16.31, and other verses to those people who are not in a harmonious relationship to God through Jesus Christ. We're looking at these reasons here, and we're just on verse 3. So if we continue on, I highlighted some words here. Remember, um, he presented himself alive, not dead, by many, what, infallible proofs. That word is tekmeroys. It's a criterion of certainty, that word infallible proofs. It's convincing proof. It's not, uh, they weren't hoping, they weren't crossing their fingers, hoping that he came back. Uh, these were, there were, according to verse 3, many infallible proofs. They saw the resurrected Christ. And at one point, he appeared to as many as 500 people. Where is that found, by the way? Is that, is that uh, sufficient evidence and support if you had over 500 people saying that they saw the risen Christ? Is that, what do you think? Linda, you are in a law office. What do you think a lawyer needs how many to prove someone guilty? What would you say? Okay, one person, you're guilty. You might be able to stretch it a little bit and argue back and forth for a little while, right? How about two? How about three? Let's just, let's just say ten. Ten people in a chair saying, Your Honor, we saw this happen. Why don't we double that? Let's make it twenty. Let's double that. Let's make it forty. You think you have support on your side? How about doubling that? Let's make it 80. Let's just round it up to 100. Let's just make it 100. You have 100 people on your side. You, you think you're going to win? What about 110? Could we fit 110 people here? The scripture says in 1 Corinthians 15, there were over 500 people. We couldn't fit 500 people here. You might be able to fit it up in the... No, you can't even fit in, in the building up front the, at the Lutheran Church. I don't believe you can. Steve, can we? Well, well maybe. But, um, <laughs> you know, in the Scripture in the Old Testament where it says, you know, on, on a testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact will be confirmed. So, typically, you only need two or three. Yeah. We sometimes, in our system today, we use the evidence of one person, but, you know, it's kind of sketchy sometimes because one person... True. But the impact that I see at this is that if you have 500 people who are not going to stop the acting, yeah. you all of a sudden exponentially take the 500 people who talk to other people who talk to other people who talk to other people. That's right. That's so the right. The impact is more than just the 500. If That's right. I totally agree with that. Seeing something at a sporting event, yeah. Yeah. 
they talk about it and pretty soon all of a sudden you have shares on Facebook or whatever. That's right, you know, that's right. thousand shares or whatever. It's just, it, it goes like crazy. Yeah. So yep. For the yeah. people back in that day, it would have been impactful. If you were a part of the 500, would you keep that to yourself? Let's test what Steve said. Or would you, would you gossip in a good way? Yeah, I mean, if you saw Jesus Christ, that's the guy who was crucified, and he's talking. He's alive. Would you keep that and contain it to yourself? Brett, would you? So why don't we have 500 independent writings making, well, people saying, like, hey, I saw this happen. We just have one person sure. that there's 500 people sure. out there. And I think that's sufficient, as long as 500 people can attest to that. But he doesn't think it's sufficient because he said we need more than one person Paul to um, claim that there were 500. Well, so Paul's just making that up. No, I don't think Paul's making it up. I think... Uh, but don't we need more than just Paul, according to Steve's own logic, to, to, to testify that there's these other witnesses yeah. that actually exist? Well, I think 500 corroborated is sufficient. He could have and said 10,000. He could have said 10,000. He could have said a million. But we know that that's what Paul was authorized to communicate in Corinthians. Over and there was no... Over all our trust in Paul. Sure. Because we know nothing about these. We don't even know if these 500 actually existed, right? Well, you know, that goes into a different Didn't area. Josephus and others. There's other, and I know where Brett's going with this. What's the hard, what's the hard evidence? And, you know, without going into, uh, without deviating from what we're trying to accomplish here, um, there is sound records outside of the scripture that will support the historicity of Christ. And, you know, with Paul as the author of Corinthians, as well as 12 other books, um, I think that's pretty safe to, to trust in the Apostle Paul. Um, I have every reason to believe in what Paul is saying. I don't think he is going to uh, fabricate that because if that's fabricated and if it's not true, then Paul is writing into a lie and all those who are a part of this, uh, they're they're laying their lives down. They're being threatened for a lie if they knew it wasn't true. So we have more than just Paul's Sure, story. I would say that. And we could probably look into that maybe like in, um, like if we go through something like apologetics. But here, all we're doing is just saying that uh, according to Luke, not even Paul, now Luke, the, the apostle, is able to talk about these infallible proofs and, um, and then when you combine it with the other authors of Scripture, um, there's support. There's not a collusion. There's no contradiction. There seems to be ongoing support for each of the books of the New Testament, actually. So, but I know where you're going with that. And like I said, we can probably develop that some more, like in maybe in another session or something but this is just to highlight the fact that according to Luke who was side by side with with Jesus Christ he said that there were many infallible proofs seen during the 40 days so even if we take away the 500 um, there's I'm going to show that there's some others who saw this that uh, we'll see in just a few moments that there's every reason to trust in the veracity of Scripture so, but that's a valid question, but um, I'm comfortable with Luke's uh, stamp of approval, Paul's stamp of approval, and we, again, we can always pursue this, because there's a lot of questions, is there not, that we may not be able to answer at the moment. So, Scripture is huge, but um, if we trust that all Scripture is God-breathed, this is a part of the all-breathe. That's a question. Yeah, see? So our job is to um, reinforce uh, what the scripture says by communicating it to others and to trust that what we see in the Bible is true. And of course, we can pursue those questions 
but at this juncture I would say that Luke is just saying that there are many infallible proofs. This is outside of Paul himself. So even Luke is saying that there are infallible proofs in his writing. See? So I'll support some more. I'll supply some, some additional information as far as witnesses. Um, not to diminish the sure. comment by um, Brett, because I know that people are looking for those kinds of comments, but in all fairness to how God has set up the word of God, even in the book of Hebrews it says, quote unquote, we understand by faith right. that the worlds were created. Mm -hmm. And no amount of scientific evidence is going to convince you except to understand by faith. Luke has already delineated many of Jesus' miracles already. Mm -hmm. John the Apostle says, Jesus said to his disciples, he says, the words that I speak to you are spirit and are life. And just the fact that we get the scriptures and we hear the word of God, mm -hmm. there's persuasive evidence within the words of scripture itself sure. that we present it to the ears of the unbeliever. They may miss the idea of the 500. They may be skeptical of that. But when we hear the word of God into the, when the people who are unbelievers hear the word of God into their ears, there's something about what like Jesus said, the spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh is no, of no profit at all. So yeah. There's something, for the lack of a better expression, something mystical. Right. The wind blows with will and you hear it sound. Mm -hmm. You don't know where it's coming from and yeah. where it's going. So it is with everyone who's born of the spirit. There's something mystical, magical. Sure, I totally agree with that. How God convinces through his word, but yet yeah. in all fairness to Brett, people like Still. Me, myself when I was younger before I became a right. believer, I wanted empirical things, yeah. but yet it seems like God will satisfy that through apologetics on some respects, but in far some more respect. than that, just the plain word yeah. of God. And the only reason why I didn't say that part is because someone could say, well, now we're delving into feelings. And Paul went there. I mean, Luke went there. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is I do agree with what you're saying, but someone I've heard uh, it said that well now we're what what's different what's different uh, from what you're saying would like say a Mormon who says right. let's pray and there should be a burning of the bosom and then people go away thinking you know what I did feel something I'm not talking about I know I know you're not I'm, I'm not about yeah how God works in a way that yeah the by faith part is, is, is truthful is, is, way, the way not the works with his all, word. all I'm saying yeah yeah sure Nicodemus yeah and and I I, I I'm in I am t in total agreement with you but the difficulty there is when you're talking to someone who is more evidence-based right so they would yeah they would say well you know how do how come I don't feel it see we're in the, we're in the same text and I'm not walking away with that so I, I agree with that. I just, I don't use that much because, unless they're a believer already, because someone will easily squash that and say, well, that's how you feel. That's how you feel. The spirit is somehow talking to you, but not talking to me. And I'm interested in learning truth. I mean, have you heard that before? Uh, I'm wanting to know the truth. I'm, I'm asking, reveal yourself to me. And how is it that the spirit is communicating these things to you, but not to me? See, so I, I, I don't use that much. Maybe amongst believers when we're talking, I think that's biblically sound because it says it. But to the skeptic or the agnostic, they're, because they're driven I, I, in, in a lot of ways by their feelings, they, they don't feel that. See, so now it's the, the difficulty is saying, well, you know, I know you want evidence and I may not be able to fully show you evidence that might please you, but one, sometimes I've said, well, what, what kind of evidence would suffice for you? And usually they don't have an answer to that. So I said, if you can't give me what you're looking for, then how do you know you haven't already seen it based on our discussion? So if you don't know what you're looking for, how do you know you haven't seen it yet? And two, the scripture is clear that it, without faith it's impossible to please God. So faith is that component that is connected with the believers. But for the unbeliever or the skeptic or the agnostic, as Brett was saying, sometimes that's hard, but, you know, constant, uh, I think, when, when a person is questioning everything, 
saturate that person with a lot of prayer and do your best to to come up with more evidence if they're a evidence-based person because I'm, I'm fully confident that if we would dig deep enough, there's someone out there that might be able to satisfy um, the things that maybe that person is looking for. Yeah, because the text <clears throat> itself, in both texts, yeah. it's goading us to examine the evidence. Yeah. That's why I even bring up yeah. Um, yeah. that there were infallible proofs or that there were yeah. 500 witnesses. Yeah. Yeah. That is provoking us to go, yeah. oh, you're claiming there's evidence. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, I, and I will supply some, some more appearances outside of the 1 Corinthians 15. So, Mark? Well, I was going to say, I, I, when I became a Christian, I, you know, like uh, Steve was saying, I, the Word of God penetrated and, you know, Holy Spirit convicted me and I, was, I became a believer. But after that, I had a ton of questions. And sure. I, the, the thing about the Bible is, of any religious book in the world, in the history of the world, this has been more attested by archaeology, by facts. It's faith founded on facts. So there's, there's a thing called credulity, which is just basically, well, I feel it, I believe it, I have the burning in the bosom. <laughs> but, th but this book, yeah, we are convicted, the belief the non believer is convicted to believe by the power of the Spirit and hearing the Word of God. But also I think it's legitimate to um, have those, an those answers available to them. Sure, be sure. Well-rounded. Especially, yeah. the, the, there's a book by a guy named John Mark Montgomery it's called Faith. It's an old book. Oh, it's yeah, he's a lawyer. You know, and it goes through the historical uh -huh. background of the scriptures. And it really yeah. takes, the, it takes the Bible and looks at it as a regular book. It doesn't approach it as a book. As right, a, right. As the Word of God. Right. And it says, take it as a regular book. Mm -hmm. And you'll find out that this historicity of this thing is so valid. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. Who's the author of that again, please? John Warwick Montgomery. John Warwick Montgomery? Former lawyer, I believe, yeah. right? He's in his Solid. He's... Solid apologist. Yeah. Uh, he's a, he was um, around the time of Walter Martin yeah. and um, who's the other one? Simon Greenleaf. Mm -hmm. So these are Simon Greenleaf and John Warwick Montgomery were former lawyers that uh, put the Bible to the test. And I think, but Warwick uh, had a slightly different approach from Simon Greenleaf. Simon Greenleaf was challenged by one of his students when he was uh, just a lawyer. He wasn't a Christian. He said, why don't you test the, the records of the New Testament and see how it holds up to the, your principles? There's a book called the Evidence that Demands a Verdict, too. I don't know if you guys knew that he from the 80s. Josh McDowell. Yes, yeah, so that's still on. A very good book too. He's written several revisions, and now he has a compilation of uh, it's like 800 pages now. So the expanded edition, it's in uh, goldback. Uh, it's, it's a nice book to have. Um, and and one more thing as we move on, um, which I think is worth pointing out too, since Brett raised a, a legitimate question. You know, the truth is, it was also Paul who was talking to the Corinthians and he was surprised that within his, the assembly of the Corinthian church there were some who did not believe in the resurrection either. In fact, turn to 1 Corinthians 15 and I want you to see that this was a problem even for the church back then. Yeah, so I want you to see why this is where a lot of people will quote uh, the gospel. They will say this is the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. And I do believe it is the gospel, but I don't think it's the gospel uh, in a salvific manner. I mean, I don't think what Paul was trying to do here was to save the Corinthian church. Because notice what he says in verse 1. I'm going to just read a few verses and I'll carry you along and tell you what verse I'm looking at next. Verse 1 says, moreover what? Brethren. So he's talking to the brethren of the church at Corinth. So they are believers in Christ. And he says, I declare to you the gospel, euangelion, which I preach to you, meaning he already preached it to them, which you also received in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. 
For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Verse 5, and that he was seen by Cephas, and then by the twelve, so you've got two there, classifications of witnesses, and then after he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have, notice, fallen asleep. They were Christians. Uh, they've gone to sleep. That's a euphemism for a person who is a believer in Christ who have died. And then after he was seen by James and by all the apostles, then last of all he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. Now, go to verse 12. He's now going to start to unpack the reason why he's talking about what he talked about. He says, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Who is he talking to? Believers. believers. Where are these believers? Corinthians. Corinthian church. So notice what he says here. Um, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Ooh. Interesting. Hmm. What else does he say? And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. So what is he saying? We're wasting our time. I can't believe... You remember I preached to you the gospel, you stand by it, lest it's in vain. Remember all that before we were together? He goes, how come I heard some of you don't even believe in the resurrection? Brethren, Corinthians, church members, why is it that some of you, and he didn't say all of them, some of you don't believe in the resurrection? And if Christ is not risen, we're wasting our time. We shouldn't be preaching. Our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty, because if he's dead, then we're in trouble. What are we believing in? Yes, we are found, verse 15, false witnesses of God, if, if Christ didn't rise. We are found false witnesses of Christ because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up, and in fact the dead did not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not what? Okay, so if you guys don't believe he rose from the dead, then we're in trouble. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen in sleep, asleep in Christ have perished. Oh my gosh, that's bad news, right? In this life only, we have hope in Christ. We are all of men the most pitiable. So what is he saying? There actually are going to be times when believers don't believe in the resurrection and they have doubt, when they have questions. Paul answers that. So if someone today were to question that, hey, Paul went through that himself. The Corinthian church some of them didn't even believe it as well. So Paul argues using verse 1 to about verse, what, 12, 11? And then he says, look, guys, let, let's just bottom line this. If Christ did not rise, I'm wasting my time. You're wasting your time. People who have died have perished. And we might as well basically do whatever we want. That's my, Freddie's insert at the end. Emily. I mean, that's Freddie. There's a lot of religion out there who disapprove and put to where Christ didn't die. So us as believers in church, why can't we, why are we questioning that? Yeah. Because that's who we really are. It's not questioning what we believe. Yeah. In well, you know, the, the thing is, the reality is today we have a lot of people who like to uh, see hard evidence. And one of, uh, the, one of the key people on the team of Jesus, Thomas, was like that too, right? So uh, there are people today 
whether here or other churches or around the world, they want evidence. And, and that's, not, that's not something we should say, shame on you. I mean, that means that the person is more inclined to being objective. That's, their, that's how they reason, that's how they look at things, that's their grid, their filter, and that's perfectly fine. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with raising questions and even wondering if the scripture really means what it says. I mean, if the Corinthian church can do this, if, you know, if we're seeing what we're seeing uh, amongst his disciples, like Thomas, I won't believe you until I see him for myself. I know we were, he kept preaching that he needed to die and come back from the dead, but you know what? I just got to, I, I, I need to put my hand, my finger in, in his hand and in his side. The world, though, is already like that. That's, what That's we're, right. You, you're out there. Out there is like they don't believe that it's real. But I think this, the, the unique 12, the fantastic 12 that was with Jesus mm -hmm. kind of covers all of us. Right? Some of us are real short. No, no, I'll go with you wherever you want to go. And then they, among, when there's pressure, they, oh, no, not me, not me. You got me mistaken for someone else. Or I need evidence, you know, or the simple. There, you know, you look closely at the lives of the disciples and you could probably identify with one of them or multiple, uh, maybe several of them. But God is uniquely... Uh, made us different amongst the uh, brethren. We're hands, feet, eyes, ears, feet, and so on. So there's nothing wrong when you, when you have a question regarding the text of Scripture. I think it's, it's normal. I think it's valid to have questions because if the disciples had questions, if Paul had questions, if some of them didn't even believe in the resurrection, then that speaks of churches today. I mean, that just kind of reminds us that even among the brethren, closer to the time of Christ, could still question certain things. So all we can do is just keep pushing, moving forward, and do the best that we can, cover the scripture to the best of our ability, and come up with some uh, answers by those who have uh, spent their lives or their life uh, researching those things like in the area of apologetics. I think Mark had a question, Brett had a question, then you, Steve. Well, I was just going to say that um, Luke was a physician. He was a doctor. Read, yeah, and if you read a, even the beginning of Luke, yes. it seemed fitting for me to, as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you. Yeah. So Luke was always talking from the point of view of evidence. Yeah. So even when he presents the gospel in his name, he's, mm -hmm. he's starting out, he's not saying, oh, you know, I didn't. You know, just go ahead and believe this. Yeah, He's that's saying, right. Here's the evidence. That's right. I saw it. Yeah. He felt it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and again, he was uh, the, the great physician. So he was very technical. When you read his writings, he's very detailed and thorough. So as a doctor um, who was there to witness these things, yeah, you would expect him to, to be critical on some of these matters. So... Brett, you had a question? Was that uh, your hand? Yeah, I was going to respond to the, kind of the earlier thing by saying, like, if you take another religion <coughs> like Mormonism, the core of Mormonism is this idea that Joseph Smith was visited by an angel and given golden tablets. Yeah. If you, if that core part is disbelieved, then the whole religion sure. falls apart. We do have a core, and it's mm -hmm. that. Um, and Jesus died and rose, and God rose him from the dead. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that core communicates if that happened, then God is favoring Jesus and all his teachings. Sure. So if there's any place to look at the evidence around, I would say the core would be the time to do it. Yeah. As far as uh, like Jesus being resurrected and all. Yeah, yeah as as I agree. Death and resurrection. Just <clears throat> in the same way that with Mormonism, I want to know about this Joseph Smith guy. Is he a credible person or mm -hmm. is he a suspect yeah. person? Yeah, very good. And he was visited, but they have conflicting stories too. An angel, it was Jesus, it was an angel. 
And then they split. They had the uh, Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints and then the reorganized Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So um, very interesting when you look into the history of the Mormon Church and some of the things that they teach even conflicts within their own writings, their own books. So I do believe he was visited by a angelic or supernatural presence, but it's not God, I don't think. So, but we could save that for another discussion. Uh, Steve, you had a question? Oh, just a comment in Come. regard to um, Thomas, is that Thomas was not there when, when the Lord Jesus came into the room the first time. And 11 of the 12 disciples said, hey, we saw the Lord. He did not believe That's right. the 11. So to think that we will convince somebody if 11 of his own people would not yeah. convince him. Well, 10. Uh, yeah. Judas was not there. Yeah. Um, but anyways, then eight days later, Jesus came in again and you know, addressed him. And right. Thomas sees and says, put your finger here. Yeah, yeah. My Lord and my God. Yeah. And then the text after that, you know, for as far as Thomas, it says, after he said, my Lord and my God, Thomas said that because you have seen Jesus told him, you have believed. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me, yet have believed. Yeah. And that's for all the people who want some kind of evidence that there is mm -hmm. a blessing for those who just simply by faith take and believe these things that right. the Spirit of God communicates through his words. So there's something Yeah, well, I, I like that. Heads who want evidence <laughs> but can't have it. Yeah. Whatever, so. Well, amongst his own I, I, team. I fall into that category. Yeah, uh, we all are on the same team, Steve, so I appreciate that. So, good questions and valid and was even addressed uh, in the early church. So, um, no, no need to feel bad about that. I mean, his own, uh, the Corinthian church even had some questions with regards to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, um, we have a few minutes, so let me just tackle some of the resurrection appearances. There are, I think, 12. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the beginning of Christianity. If Christ had not been resurrected... I'm sorry? Back in the book of Acts? Um, well, this, this is just a slide that I put up. I'm just uh, going to introduce multiple passages... Um, showing the appearances of Christ. There's some in Acts as well, of course. Post-resurrection. Um, if Christ had not been resurrected and seen by many um, people, Christianity would not exist today. I think we would all agree uh, with that, right? We wouldn't. That's why I asked you earlier, would you be here if there was no resurrection? And that's a very persuasive argument to be a Christian because Christianity is the only system that I'm aware of that purports to have a risen founder and that was backed up with multiple claims and eyewitnesses. So Christianity would not exist today. Would that be the test of a cult? What's that? If they believe in the true resurrection of Christ, I just want to kind of test of a cult. Well, if they deny Jesus came in the flesh, then that would be the cult, according to John, First John. So, um, and they have their own. I've had, I've talked to uh, some some cultists that would say that they believe in the resurrection, but that he was raised a spiritual person rather than a physical person. You see, so. <clears throat> Jesus made 12 appearances after his resurrection. So let's look at these here. Is that in a 40-day period? Yes, 40-day period. Number one, um, his first appearance was to Mary Magdalene. And on that early Sunday morning, you find this in Mark 16, 9, John 20, 10 to 18. Let's uh, look at that just real quickly. And I'll, I'll, I'll be the one to read it for the sake of time and for the recording. Let's look at, let, let's take John, John's account. I, I'm always 
when I when I see this, um, I sometimes would try to imagine what it was like when Jesus uh, revealed Himself to to her. How would I have responded? So in verse ten, the disciples went away. Uh, John twenty. The disciples went away again to their own homes. But, verse 11, But Mary Magdalene, Mary, stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you had if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. She's a doubt in Thomas too. Hmm? She's a doubt in Thomas too. Well, the body is missing. So she's, she's thinking the gardener may have taken the body. She's weeping. She knows he died. And so at this point, she's just wanting to know where the body was, right? So Jesus said to her, imagine this, Mary. That's all he says, right? She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. She recognized the voice. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my, brother, my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. That's the first of 12. Does anybody remember who this Mary Magdalene is? There's several Marys in the Bible, right? We sometimes can get them mixed up. There is, for example, Mary, the mother of Jesus. You find that in Matthew 2, 11. <clears throat> yeah. That's right. Mary, the mother of James and John. You find that in Matthew 27, 56. Mary, the sister of Martha, John 11. Uh, Mary Magdalene, which is who we're looking at now. Um, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, John 19. Mary, who was greeted by Paul. You find that uh, in Romans 16, 6. Now, from what I've gathered, this woman was there during the crucifixion as well as the resurrection. And we, we see her in John 10, uh, John 20, talking to Christ. But it's interesting because the Mary Magdalene was uh, mentioned about 12 times in the Gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, about 12 times. So she, her name comes up in the, the Gospels more than the apostles themselves. Most of the apostles, Mary's name, Mary Magdalene, comes up more than the majority of these apostles. And in, did I write it down? Um, I did. In Luke 8, 2, as well as Mark 16, 9, this woman had not one demon, not two demons, seven demons. Anybody have a demon in the past? Okay. She had seven demons in her. And now she's rooting for Christ. In fact, they say she's a follower of Christ. Wherever he would go, she would support his ministry. 
So Mary Magdalene was the first appearance. I'll do one more and then we'll resume this next week. He also appeared, when you look at Matthew 28, to the women returning from the tomb. The women are always there. They're not the scaredy cats. The men were the scaredy cats. And the women were there returning from the tomb. Matthew 28, 9 to 10. And you find that uh, in, in the, the tail end of Matthew where you find the, the um, go and make disciples of all nations and so on. So Matthew 28, 9 through 10, these women saw Jesus. Um, so, and we'll continue this next week. Again, there are 12. And uh, it would be worth uh, looking closely um, as we go through this so that we can see the evidence of his appearance or his resurrection. And hopefully that'll, um, we can add that to our um, information when we talk to people about Christ and that will motivate us because we're seeing that there is sufficient evidence amongst people not just in a particular group not just the disciples but there's a myriad of people that were there to see the risen Savior and I'll close on this note the authors of scripture there's 40 plus they say a little over 40 all of the books support and reinforce each other, adding credibility to the uniqueness of the scripture, both Old and New Testament. Whatever you see in the Old Testament, it will support the New Testament and vice versa. There are some subtle changes, but in the end, ultimately, there are, it, it is anchored in faith. Either we're looking, back or we're looking forward to the person that is prophesied in Genesis 3, or we're looking back from 2017 and we're thinking about the cross and what Jesus had accomplished how he was the propitiation for the sin debt so the com key component either direction in the beginning or in the end or during the church age is still linked to faith and so as we continue to grow and mature in the word some of these things will crystallize and become much more pronounced as we mature and if we don't understand certain things now it doesn't mean that we will never understand those things. It could be that we just need to advance and mature, just like a child needs to grow from milk, go from milk to meat. Might be that we need to reach a point in our spiritual walk where we're in a position where we can understand clearly these things. We know that 1 Corinthians 2 talks about how the things of God's word can only be understood by the Spirit of God. And so when you see this in 1 Corinthians 2, and then you see this in 1 Corinthians 3, the mere man or the natural man cannot understand these things. We can, because we have the Holy Spirit. We can, because we have the human spirit. Coupled together, it should become much more easier to discern and understand these things as we exercise through experience, ultimately knowing right from wrong, Hebrews chapter 5. So for now... Let's close in a word of prayer and then we'll resume here with the resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ next week. Father, thank you as always for affording us the time to come together so that we can learn more about your word. And Father, we all are in agreement here that we do not understand every single detail as found in the scripture. I think a lot of the things that we see, even if we don't understand it, I think this is the, where the component of faith co comes in, where we have to trust in you as far as what you have said in your word. We anchor a lot of what we do, a lot of what we say, a lot of how we think based on the things that we know clearly as spelled out in the scripture. And we look forward to the day where we will know it inside and out, and I think that will be when we are ultimately face to face with thee because of our personal relationship to your son, Jesus Christ. So we thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We ask now that you would uh, bless our fellowship time after this, as well as the food that's pre prepared on that table in the back. We ask that you would bless it, allow it to nourish our bodies so that we can continue to enjoy the rest of the day, worshiping you in spirit and in truth. And we ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.